Hi there and welcome back to Bax EDM. I've been super, super busy, uh, especially busy with uh, developing some new things that will completely transform DIY EDM machines. Um, I'll make a couple of videos about that, uh, but it's not done yet. Um, so you have to be a bit more patient, um, but it's on the way. Until then, I'll make videos about my Sile X7 milling machine and me making parts with it. Uh, so in the last video I showed uh, how I got the milling machine into my shop and this video will be about uh, what you need to do in order to get it up and running. Now so yeah in this video I'll cover what you need to do in order to get it up and running. Um, I'll explain a bit on the things that went wrong for me during installation and how I got around that and I'll give an uh, example uh, of the first part that I machined on my Silo X7. Now, before we continue, you should note that this video is sponsored by Sile Machine Tools. And in my personal opinion, I think Sile machines offer great value for money. Uh, so if you are a small business or maybe even a hobbyist, then uh, Sile Machine Tools is definitely one of the brands you need to consider uh, if you would like to purchase a CNC machine. Okay, um, machine installation. So you basically need to do a few things. You need to hook up power. You need to add three different types of oils to three different oil reservoirs. Um, you need to hook up air and you need to fill the machine with coolant. So let's have a look at that first. So for the uh, mains connection, I already had a three phase mains outlet, uh, three times 16 amps. Uh, what I did is I purchased a extension cord and routed that over the ceiling because I don't like cables on the floor. Routed that over the ceiling into my machine. And on the other side, let's open up the cabinet. I have a flashlight here because there is no lighting inside the cabinet. On the other side, I snipped the, uh, the end of the uh, extension cable and just uh, crimped ring terminals to the individual leads. So there are three phases and ground and then the neutral, I taped it off because you don't connect that one. Once you've hooked it up and turned the machine on, you can uh, engage your cooling pump and then uh, have a look at the cooling veins inside the pump and at the mark on top um, to see if it's spinning in the right direction. Uh, if it's not, then turn everything off and uh, flip two of the phases around. So then you will uh, correct your phase problem if there is any. I, d I did not have a phase problem, so for me it works straight away. So on the side of the machine is the uh, oil pump for the uh, slideways and the ball screws. Um, you can flip off uh, the cap, add a funnel and then just uh, pour your uh, slideway oil in. Pretty easy. Here's the uh, oil that I used. ISO 68 from Eurol. Uh, pretty basic stuff. So here's the uh, inlet for uh, air for the uh, machine. With a straightforward uh, regulator, pretty standard stuff. And that's where you need to add the uh, pneumatic oil. So it wasn't uh, listed on the machine what type of oil I should use for that reservoir. Um, but I have other machines that have like an inline oil reservoir just like it. And for those machines I use this uh, ISO 32 oil. Uh, so I used it for uh, my CNC mill as well. So after filling the whey oil and the hydraulic oil, I noticed that there is a third place that needs to be filled with oil. And that's for the drawbar, uh, ISO 32 oil. So it took me a long time actually to figure out where uh, that oil needs to be added. Uh, let me show you. Uh, so let me take a flashlight. So on top of the machine, I lowered the uh, Z axis all the way down. Now I need to climb onto a stair here. So this is the uh, top of the machine. There's a hole here. And there's a very small little 
reservoir there that you can fill with hydraulic oil, as you can see. So, uh, yeah, that's the third place. It seems like I actually need to fill it right now. Not sure how much oil it consumes, but it's hard to reach. So you'll need a bottle with a hose or something to, uh, to squeeze it in. So the coolant tank and the chip tray, uh, they rest on a frame with wheels, so you can pull it back from the machine to uh, perform maintenance. Uh, the coolant tank is actually pr pretty big. I had to add somewhere in between 10 and 15 buckets full of uh, coolant to get the level meter to go halfway, or a bit more than halfway. So that's a, this is a substantial amount of coolant. And the chip tray can be removed um, to, uh, to clean it and such. These are my first chips, so I actually have to start cleaning it for the first time. So for the coolant, I wanted the very best. Um, so I, I purchased a 25 liter can of Blaser Synergy 735 and this stuff is freaking expensive. Uh, this can uh, was 518 euros and that is including tax. And in order to fill the machine I used uh, less, slightly less than half of the can. So I'm hoping that uh, now the machine is already full and I just need to top it up once in a while that this other half can last me a long time. Now, according to the Blaser datasheet, you're not allowed to uh, mix the Blaser with tap water, which has a lot of uh, minerals and other contaminants in it. You need a very pure deionized water. Um, so in order to get that, um, I purchased this rig, which was about uh, somewhere between 400 and 500 euros. Um, in order to get uh, deionized water uh, with the right conductivity level, uh, to uh, to mix blaster according to the uh, recommended specification. So this rig um, is fed with normal tap water. It also has a waistline water, the yellow one, and uh, it needs power because it has a pump that forces the tap water through all the filters and through the uh, uh, the ion exchanger or whatever you call this thing. And uh, then yeah, it has like a normal uh, tap here. Uh, I just use that to fill buckets. Um, it's it's on the floor at the moment. I still need to do a proper installation. Maybe I'll mount it to the wall or something like that. Um, but you also need something like this if you want to make your um, your coolant uh, in the proper way. Okay, that's it for the installation. Once you've hooked up power, air, uh, added all the lubricants uh, and the coolant, then you are ready to go. Uh, when I first operated the tool changer, actually, I got an error on my uh, controller stating that the air pressure was too low. Well, in fact, the uh, pressure supplied was high enough. Um, so I looked in, into that and what actually was happening was when the um, tool changer uh, consumed air, it, it consumed it in a large gush and then there was a small dip in the uh, uh, supplied pressure. Uh, that would uh, trigger the uh, sensor on the side of the machine, which was set to uh, four bars. Um, so I looked into this. Uh, it could not have been my uh, air tank because that's huge uh, with uh, uh, more than enough um, pressure. Um, so it, it turned out that the air hose uh, supplying the machine uh, has a diameter that is too small. So the machine actually requires you to hook up a 10 millimeter air hose but a 10 millimeter air hose, I think, is not enough. Uh, anyway, instead of um, uh, redoing all my uh, air hoses um, with ones with a bigger diameter, I decided to lower the uh, pressure uh, on the uh, uh, on the sensor uh, from four bar to around three bar. Um, there was still apparently more than enough to uh, operate the uh, tool changer. It's still working fine. Uh, despite what the warning sticker says. Um, 
uh, and that allowed me uh, just to use it normally without uh, triggering any uh, error errors. So um, I think if you do uh, another installation, you might want to use um, air hose with a bigger diameter and then an adapter at the end that goes to 10 millimeter for the uh, machine. So uh, yeah, but that's basically the only problem I had during installation. So the first part that I wanted to machine on my Sio X7 is this front panel. Um, I need to make holes in this panel. Uh, however, I do not have a nice way of fixturing this thin piece, at least not without scratching or damaging it, because this is quite scratch sensitive, uh, being anodized aluminum. Um, so I decided that the first part should actually be a custom vacuum fixture in order to hold this part down. So I designed a custom vacuum fixture and that is actually the first part that I machined on my uh, on my sile. I have some uh, footage of that. Uh, let's have a look at it. I do not have all uh, footage um, because I was it being the first part. I was I was watching uh, the machine like a hawk with my hand on the e stop, not having time to video everything. And it was actually a good thing that I did. Uh, because if my hand was not on the e-stop, it would have crashed severely. Um, let's first look at the, uh, at the footage. Okay, so I put the uh, vise on the bed. The stock is to the right dimensions. Loaded the stock in the vise. Then uh, with my Heimer, I zeroed uh, the G54 coordinate system to this point here. And preloaded all my tools, so I have a 8mm milling bit here, 3mm milling bit, center drill, normal drill, and a chamfering mill. Now it's time to run the code, and uh, fingers crossed. Okay, so the part is done, really happy how it turned out. Uh, but it didn't go right the first try. Um, I was watching the machine like a hawk with my uh, hand on the emergency stop. And if I weren't, I would have crashed severely uh, because there was an error in the G-code. Um, something wrong with the uh, post processor. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so what went wrong is something with the post processor. Um, so for the post processor, I just went to the Autodesk Fusion 360 website for post processors, looked for my machine, and there was only a single post processor available. So I downloaded and installed that and decided to use that. Um, well, actually, the Sile X7 comes with two different types of tool changers. There is an umbrella style tool changer. Uh, that's the one that's currently on, uh, on my machine. And there is another type. I'm not sure how you call that one. Um, but anyway, the post processor uh, that you download from the Fusion website, uh, from the Autodesk website, is uh, um, not the umbrella style uh, tool changer. So I was using uh, the wrong post. I didn't know that uh, because you know I just downloaded the only one that was available. Um, so what the machine was actually doing um, was it was loading the correct tool. Um, and then swapping it out for an incorrect tool and then trying to perform the operation with the wrong tool at the height of the correct tool. Um, and the, the tool that it was loading incorrectly at a longer height. So uh, there was a, like a tool offset uh, problem. So if I would have not pressed the e-stop in time, I would have had quite a big, uh, quite a big crash. So initially, I didn't know what, what was going on. Um, so I, I asked around a bit and there was, there was one guy who, who mentioned, hey, uh, this must be something related to tool changes and preloading. So I checked the uh, post processor and there's a line in the post processor that says uh, uh, tool preload or something with preload. Um, true, uh, which should be false. So if you change the true to false, uh, regenerate your code, then you're uh, ready to go. Um, so uh, yeah, I was uh, in retrospect happy that I was so anxious with my finger on the e-stop. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would have not turned out so nice. So here's how the vacuum fixture turned out. I'm super happy with the uh, finishing on it. 
As you can see, it has uh, two locating pins uh, for the uh, front panel to uh, locate on and a pocket uh, where I can machine holes in the front panel without the uh, vacuum dropping off. Okay, so I took my Heimer and made this point here, the G54 coordinate system. The uh, vacuum hose is routed like so, so I can close the door. And uh, yeah, I'll press cycle start. And we uh, should be ready to go. Set it in auto mode. Cycle start here. Oh. That's the first op. Tool change. That's it. Okay, that's it for uh, this video. Um, hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one.